this uh, opportunity to, to come together uh, in this new age of technology. We pray that this technology will help us to continue to spread the good news, to evangelize, to, to, to share and to support and to encourage our faithful. We thank you, Lord, for this opportunity. May you bless this effort. May you allow it to come all together quite well. We thank you, we bless you, and we say this all in your good name, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. 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 On Holy Spirit. Uh, on this feast of the Assumption of the Blessed Virgin Mary, uh, we say, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. With thee. Bless our Lord. Blessed is the Bless fruit of thy womb. Holy Mary, Mary Mother, Mary, Mother, Mother, Mother of God, God, pray for us pray sinners, for us sinners for now in the hour of our death. Amen. Amen. Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, I just wanted to, again, uh, share with you that we have a very uh, exciting schedule, agenda, uh, and uh, the bishop, I'll introduce him briefly, uh, but before that, uh, we are going to have a Q&A, uh, and, and uh, because this is the first time for all of us, we're going to ask Matthew Gagani, who's our moderator, to kind of walk us through how that is going to be done at the back end after the talk. Matt? Great, thank you, Santos. And though, as my name plate says, Santos Hernandez, I'm actually Matthew Gargani. Uh, Dad, I haven't changed my name. My father is on the call as well. Uh, so because we have so many people and it's a little hard uh, using a Zoom call to have us all here at the same time, we're actually going to use the chat function. So if you look at the bottom of your screen, you should see a little chat bubble. Uh, and I've made it so that whenever you send in a question via chat, It'll come to me. That way, if we get 100 questions, uh, they're not all being flooded in uh, at once. I'll go through and try to pick if there's common ones, ask those. And then I'll vocalize them to Bishop so that everyone can hear it. Then he'll have the opportunity to answer them. Also, uh, during the uh, speaking portion itself, I'll make sure that everyone is muted and also be turning up everyone's video so that we can all focus more easily on Bishop. And I have the functionality to handle all that technology so you don't have to worry about clicking any buttons that you're not comfortable clicking. Anything else you want me to cover, Santos? No, that's it. Thank you very much, Matthew, appreciate that. All right, let us just take a few minutes to introduce our, our, our very special guest, uh, Bishop uh, uh, William Walterscheid. Uh, I learned a little bit about him. Uh, you know, he was born in Ashland, Pennsylvania in 56. After uh, graduating from high school, uh, he worked in the health field uh, and uh, he graduated from Pottsville Hospital Church of uh, School of uh, Nursing in 83. And then in, in 1985, he was accepted as a candidate for the seminary formation in the Diocese of uh, Harrisburg. Uh, he studied at St. John Seminary College uh, in Massachusetts and received his degree in liberal arts with a concentration in philosophy and classical language. Uh, in 1988, uh, he was sent to uh, Rome for continued formation uh, for the priesthood, and there he received his degree in theology uh, and a license in demonic, uh, dom dom I'll be here, dogmatic theology from that same university. Uh, he was ordained a priest in uh, 1992 in Harrisburg. Uh, he returned back to Rome and served on the faculty there at the North American College until uh, 2003. In 2006, he was appointed the diocese uh, the secretary for clergy and consecrated life. And in 2011, uh, uh, Pope uh, Benedict appointed him as the auxiliary bishop of the Diocese of Pittsburgh and the uh, titular bishop of California. Uh, today, uh, the bishop serves as the vicar general and the vicar of evangelization for the Diocese of Pittsburgh. Uh, I've asked uh, the bishop to come and speak to our men about the current climate of the world and the church and the rich harvest that we see before us and how lay ministries, especially like uh, groups like the Catholic Men's Fellowship, could, uh, could certainly respond to this calling. And with that, I'd like to go ahead and welcome the bishop. Wonderful. Santos, thank you so very, very much. And I just want to say what a tremendous joy and privilege 
it is to be with all of you today and to uh, speak to you about um, something that's near and dear to my heart, and uh, that is the Catholic Church. Because we believe that the Catholic Church is the body of Christ on earth. And uh, we know that in the Catechism, there's a wonderful quote from St. John, Joan of Arc, who says, um, the relationship between the church and Christ, she says, well, it's simply the same thing. What's so complicated about it? And it's true. The church is the body of Christ on earth. So where do we find Christ? We find Christ in his body, the church. There's no doubt about it. Uh, there is, it's a great uh, honor to be with you on this feast of the Assumption of Our Lady, Body and Soul into Heaven. And in the first reading from today's Mass from the Book of Revelation, chapter 12, we have that wonderful reading that starts uh, speaking about the great sign that appeared in the heavens. A woman clothed with the sun and the moon was under her feet and upon her head a crown of 12 stars. It's a sign for us that we're gathered together on this feast of her assumption into heaven. And it's a sign of hope. And so uh, we've already prayed, but I would like to pray now asking the Holy Spirit to come upon us and to guide us and to direct us and to ask for her intercession and her guidance. In the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. Come, O Holy Spirit, and fill our hearts with your love and with your grace and help us always to seek the will of God and to do it with perfect love and fidelity. We turn to Our Lady and we pray. August Queen of Heaven, Sovereign Mistress of the Angels, who did receive from the beginning the mission and the power to crush the serpent's head. We beseech you to send your holy angels that under your command and by their power they may pursue the evil spirits encounter them on every side, resist their bold attacks, and drive them hence into the abyss of woe. Most Holy Mother, send your legions of angels to defend us and to guide us and help us. All you holy angels and archangels, help us and defend us. Our Lady, assumed into heaven, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In 1982, on the 13th of May, Pope St. John Paul II made a pilgrimage to the shrine in Fatima. And it was to give thanks to Our Lady for having spared him from the assassination attempt that happened just one year to the day earlier. And that was May 13th, 1981, when we remember that horrific event as he was in his uh, uh, boatmobile driving through St. Peter's Square and uh, meeting the faithful and blessing them. Three shots fired out and he was hit and was seriously wounded. Pope John Paul II said when he went to Fatima, in God's providence, there are no coincidences. And I believe that with my whole heart. I believe also that it was true for his life but for every one of our lives, the exact same thing is true. There are no coincidences in life. Why? Because God, our Heavenly Father, has a plan, and that plan includes each and every one of us. There is absolutely no doubt about that. And I know, I believe with my whole heart, that each one of you and I, created by God, redeemed by the precious blood of Christ, and sanctified by the Holy Spirit, that we are placed in this place, at this time, in God's church, to fulfill God's great plan of mercy, of salvation and love and that he wants to use each one of us in our complete freedom of will to be able to bring the good news of Jesus Christ, his gospel, and the teachings of his body, the church, to the world, and especially in this part of the world in southwestern Pennsylvania. 
every one of us has a part to play. Every one of us at this time must hear the call that God has for us. Now, what about this world in which we live? What's it looking like? Well, it's looking like this, that in our diocese and in most of Northeastern and most and many other parts of the world, such as in Europe and especially in Western Europe, it seems that the church is in a great decline, doesn't it? It seems this way. In our diocese, over the last 20 years, there has been a 40% decrease in mass attendance and the reception of the sacraments. If we were a secular organization, we'd say, wow, we are really in bad trouble. We would say that, you know, it's not looking good. We're probably not going to make it. But we know that that's never true for the church, no matter what challenges there are. We know that our church has been really assailed by many difficulties over the last 40 or 50 years in particular. Bishop Sheen of Venerable Memory has this to say about crises in the church. He said, you know, every 500 years there's a crisis in the church. The first 500, at the end of that, we had the crisis of the identity of who Christ was. And you know, we had the ecumenical councils of Nicaea and Chalcedon and Ephesus, those great meetings of bishops guided by the Holy Spirit that led us to know and to believe based on what we found in scripture and in the holy tradition of the church, that, God, that Jesus Christ is true God and true man. He's a divine person. He's the second person of the Blessed Trinity. And on that, our faith is founded. Bishop Sheen went on to say that in the year 1000, thereabouts, it was a crisis of the uh, office and the ministry of the Holy Father, the Pope. And we know in the year 1054 was the great schism when East and West separated. There was great misunderstandings about but we know that the Holy Father is the vicar of Christ on earth and the successor of St. Peter. In the year uh, 1500 and thereafter, especially that 16th century, we saw a great rupture in uh, what the church is herself with uh, the Reformation and uh, the, the founding of all kinds of other churches that did not agree with what sacred tradition and the scripture had told us about the church through those first 1500 years. And that brings us now to this time in which we're living. Bishop Sheen says, the great crisis for us today is that the world influences the church more than the church influences the world. And we've certainly seen that, haven't we? With secularism, huh? that worldliness, the diminishment of the life of faith. We know we live in a culture and in a society that has little regard for religion or faith, religious faith. And in a particular way, the Catholic Church is kind of dismissed, dismeaned, and disrespected. We know that to be Catholic is not a badge of honor in the United States and in really most of the West today. I think that tells us that, well, we're probably doing something right, huh? Somewhere along the line, because, you know, we have the truth that Christ has given us. But really what is our challenge today is to be able to present it in a way that people can hear it, can ponder it, and can embrace it. That's where you and I come in, without a doubt. In this age of secularism, materialism, dismissal of religion, in this age of individualism and even egoism, I would say, we have to proclaim that Christ is with us always, no exceptions. 
just when we thought that things couldn't get worse, after the clergy sexual abuse scandal, just when we thought that things were really difficult, the coronavirus, huh? COVID-19 hits us. And what it does is it deprives us of the very life of grace in the sacraments. And of course, the restriction on the celebration of mass and the other sacraments, necessary as it was for the protection of people, has left a great longing and a great sort of vacuum in the lives of Catholics. Thank God we're beginning to open up slowly and cautiously. But you know, there is so much work for us to do together. But today on this Feast of the Assumption, we know we have tremendous hope. Why? We know that Our Lady's Ascension, Body and Soul into Heaven, is the roadmap for us to follow. We don't look down and within. We look up and out. We look up to the things that are spiritual. And that's what was said in today's opening prayer at Mass when we prayed that our hearts and our minds would be set on those things above. That's our hope. We know that this world isn't our forever home, but that rather the kingdom awaits us. There's no doubt about it. St. Therese the of the infant Jesus said, the world is the ship and not the destination. Isn't that true? The world is the ship and not the destination. We're not here forever, but there is a kingdom of eternal love and bliss that awaits us. What a message that is for us to share with the world. That brings us to what I am about now, especially in, this in our, my new position in the diocese as vicar for evangelization. Now, evangelization isn't new to me because I've been doing it even before I went to seminary as I was working in parishes, as I was teaching CCD, as I was involved in parish life. But especially since my ordination to the priesthood, evangelization has been something that has been on my heart in a very special way. What is evangelization? What is that way in which all of us together, my dear brothers, can work to bring the good news of Jesus Christ to a world that is so in need of it, even if it doesn't realize that it needs it? Well, evangelization really is the proclamation of the gospel. That is the proclamation of the person of Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, and the proclamation of the truth of the saving mystery of his passion, death, and resurrection. To whom? To everybody we can, to the whole world, so that all may come to know him, to love him, and to serve him, and to be saved by his redeeming love and mercy. The Second Vatican Council spoke of it very, very clearly when it said, everyone who is baptized has a role to play in the missionary activity of the church. That's evangelization. In the proclamation of Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Pope St. Paul VI wrote in a wonderful letter on evangelization in the modern world in 1975. Quote, we wish to confirm once more that the task of evangelizing all people constitutes the essential mission of the church. That's why the church exists. He says, it is a task and mission which the vast and profound changes of the present day make all the more urgent. Evangelization is, in fact, the grace and vocation proper to the church. He says, a clear proclamation in Jesus Christ that salvation is offered to all men is essential. Pope St. John Paul II echoed those words. And he said that this uh, evangelization is for all the baptized to be involved in. No believer in Christ. No institution of the church can avoid the supreme duty to proclaim Christ to all peoples. Pope Benedict XVI said the same thing, and Pope Francis is saying the same thing to us today. 
that everybody is called to be an evangelizer to proclaim the gospel and to proclaim the person of Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior to us all. You, as members of a, a Catholic men's fellowship in the Diocese of Pittsburgh, you are so incredibly important and so needed at this time in the life of the church. And even though you may be going through some uh, uh, sort of uh, introspection and wondering about yourselves and what your role is, I want to tell you that you, each one of you, because of your baptism, are called to proclaim Jesus Christ and to draw as many people as you can to him and to the church he founded. That's our Catholic Church. Each one of you is called to do that. And I'm going to tell you, that gives me tremendous hope. Because I'm an army of one, you know? I'm the vicar for evangelization. And in my office, there is me and a secretary. So needless to say, I can't do it all. But you know what? With you, together, we can do it. But we have to have a clear identity as Catholic men who are called to do this great work. I'd like to talk to you very briefly about what I call the alphabet of evangelization. A, B, C, D, and E. Here's a way to think about it. A stands for accept the call. That means by your baptism, you're called to be involved in evangelization. In baptism, we all receive new life in Christ. So we're baptized into his death, as St. Paul tells us, in the promise of his resurrection. And the fruit of baptism is God's life that is poured into us. How, what happens when we're baptized? Original sin is removed. Any actual sin, if a person is an adult that that person has committed, is washed away. We become sons of God, our Heavenly Father, and we become members of Christ's body, the church. And there's a wonderful prayer after the waters of baptism are poured in, uh, when we're anointed with that sacred oil chrism that tells us about what baptism is all about. The prayer goes like this. Almighty God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, has freed you from sin, given you new birth by water and the Holy Spirit, and joined you to his people. He now anoints you with the chrism of salvation so that you may remain as a member of Christ, priest, prophet, and king, unto eternal life. Amen. We're all made into priests, prophets, and kings. Not priests in the sense of those who offer Mass or those who receive the sacrament of holy orders, but rather those who belong to the, the um, priesthood of the faithful, meaning we're all called to offer the sacrifice of our lives and our hearts to God. We become prophets because a prophet isn't someone who predicts the future. Sometimes they do that, but really what a prophet is, is the one who announces the truth, and that's the truth that Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior. And king, not that we sit on a throne and rule over nations, but rather we rule over what God has given us for his greater honor and glory and for our salvation and the salvation of others. The call is given by our Lord Jesus Christ himself at the end of St. Matthew's Gospel. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority on heaven and earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I'm with you to the end of the age. When we're baptized, we receive that mission. Whether we're baptized as infants or later in life, as infants we grow into it, but so too don't we as adults grow into that great call and that mission to proclaim the gospel. Accept the call, my dear brothers. Accept the call to proclaim Christ as Lord and Savior. But how do we do that? I mean, do we just start and give ourselves over to it and not worry about anything else? No, 
we come to B, and B stands for Become Holy. The Second Vatican Council, in its decree on the church in chapter 5, told us that every one of us has a call to be a saint. The fathers of the council call it the universal call to sanctity. It's true, to holiness. We can't give what we don't have, and so we're all called to be saints. How do we do that? Well, we do that by what Christ has given us in the church. Everything that we need, we already have in the church. We have the sacrifice of the mass, the sacraments of the church, a life of prayer, the teaching of the truth, the sacramentals of the church. We have 2,000 years of great and living dynamic tradition. As I always say, we stand on the shoulders of giants. So if we want to know what it is we're called to do, we look at the history of the church and then we look forward to how we can use everything that we have to be able to proclaim the gospel to other people. So I always say, if you're really serious about this, about growing in love of Christ, mass is essential. I say that even at a time when mass can be difficult to get to because of our pandemic that we're laboring under. But really, if we really believe what we say we believe about the sacrifice of the mass, that it's the source and summit of our lives, as Vatican II says, that it is the sacrifice of Christ, that his, this bread and wine truly become his body, blood, soul, and divinity. Why aren't we there as often as possible? Daily is the ideal. While it's not always possible, it's something we should strive for. Then to go before him in the blessed sacrament and pray. What a great occasion of grace that is for us. To grow in intimate communion with Jesus who dwells with us. Huh? He said in St. Matthew's Gospel, that last line, which I always count on, Behold, I'm with you to the end of the age. He never deserts us. Mass, adoration of the blessed sacrament, a life of prayer. The rosary, how important is that? St. John Paul II told us that praying the rosary is contemplating the mysteries of the life of Christ through the eyes of his mother. It's a connection with his body, the church. Our life of prayer, the reading of Holy Scripture, all of these things are important. The sacrament of penance, where we meet Jesus in that healing love. He is the divine physician who comes in, as he told St. Faustina, the confessional is really the tribunal of mercy. It's where we meet his merciful love. So A, accept the call. B, become holy. You can't give what you don't have. And C, converse from the heart. St. John Henry Cardinal Newman, that great convert to the faith of the 19th century, was so influenced by St. Philip Neri and St. Augustine that his Episcopal motto that he took when he became a bishop was cor ad cor loquitur, which means heart speaks to heart. So we know that we must converse from our hearts. This work of proclaiming the gospel isn't just about giving information, or it's not just about communications, but rather it's about conversing from the heart. Mother Teresa used to say, who is the most important person in your life? It's the person that stands before you. That is the person with whom each one of us is called to converse. We should not be afraid to talk about our faith in Jesus Christ and in his church. St. Augustine in the confession said, O oh Lord, our hearts are restless until they rest in thee. Our hearts need you, O oh Lord Jesus. And we converse, core ad core, heart to heart with you, so that we may converse heart to heart 
with one another and with our brothers and sisters. It's about this communing from the heart, you know, the word from which we get communion, to be in union with, we must be in union with Christ our Savior. We must be members of his body, the church, and encounter him in the sacraments. They're not in empty rituals and just nice prayers that we say, but every sacrament is an encounter, living and dynamic with Jesus Christ. We must avail ourselves. And then we'll be able to converse with others from the heart. Not every relationship that we have will have the intimacy of maybe parent to child or spouse to spouse or brother to brother, brother to sister, sister to sister. But every relationship, every conversion, conversation is important that we have with the other. Every person is important. How do you think the gospel was first preached 2,000 years ago? Not by a marketing campaign, not by a uh, virtual uh, reality or the sending out of tweets or Twitters. As important as all of that is in our work in the church, cannot be denied. But the real preaching of the gospel, that witness to Christ, happened person to person, heart to heart, to be in communion with another person. So A, accept the call, B, become holy, C, converse from the heart, first with Jesus, and then with one another. D, devote yourselves to holy relationships. Devote yourselves. Devote is a word that comes from devovere in Latin, which means to make from a vow or a promise. And isn't that what relationships, especially holy relationships, are about? The promise to treat the other as Christ. The promise to be present to the other as you can. You know, St. Therese of the Infant Jesus is one of my favorite saints. And she uh, was really struggling in her spiritual life as a Carmelite nun. And she said, how am I ever going to become a saint? How am I ever going to become holy? And then by the inspiration of God's grace, she came to recognize that there was this way that she called the little way. And it was one of our trust and confidence in God's will. That he would give her exactly what she needed to be able to become a saint. I heard a talk last fall given by somebody who talked about the little way of evangelization, the little way of preaching the gospel. And this little way is one of all confidence in love. So we might think, you know, who am I? I'm just one person. I'm really not equipped to do this. I really, oh, I'm, I'm just going to give up because it just seems to be futile, huh? 40% decrease in mass attendance and receiving the sacraments. Our churches seem to be emptier and emptier. Catholic schools are closing in the diocese and throughout our country. It's so hard to do good religious formation in parishes. People don't want to talk about God. There's all kinds of culture wars and political disagreements. All kinds of things are happening that work against the work of the church. We might say, forget it. I'm not up to this. But God says to us, trust in me. I'll give you what you need. Form and dedicate yourself to holy relationships. I talk about it as God's arithmetic. Like St. Therese, who had absolute confidence in God, that's what we should strive to. By my nature, I never give up. That's not just virtue. That's just because I'm stubborn. I really never give up. But I need to tell you, it's also by a work of God's grace in my life that I give myself entirely to seek God's will, and that is to make Christ known to other people. How do I do it? I do it by encountering the person in front of me, as I said, but forming holy relationships. 
never giving up. I devote myself to it. I dedicate myself to it. And then God takes over. It's called God's arithmetic. I tell two people about Christ in my life, and I pray God to help them, and I ask them, each one of them, to tell two people. And then each one of those people to tell two people and so on and so on. It's God's arithmetic. It's how the church began and how the church continues and how the church must continue in our age today that seems to be loaded with problems. We do it a person at a time and we give ourselves over to it. Think about how did it happen in the 16th century in Mexico? You know, the Spanish came and brought missionaries with them, good and holy men, Franciscans and Dominicans, and they preached and preached and preached, and I didn't have much success. And then who comes, who steps in, but the lit mother of God, Our Lady of Guadalupe, and through a simple garment, a tilma, left a sign of her and herself, her own image, not created by any man or woman, but be created by God's hand. And millions of people came into the church. If it happened then, it can happen now. There's no doubt about it. But just as it took the faith of one simple soul, Juan Diego, now Saint Juan Diego, so it takes the faith and the holiness brothers of each one of us. Dedicate yourselves to these holy relationships and do not in any way shrink from proclaiming Christ crucified and risen and what can be found in his church. A, accept the call. B, become holy. C, converse from the heart, first with Jesus, then with one another. D, dedicate yourself to holy relationships. Spread the good news. And finally, it brings us to E. E is so appropriate for today's feast day because E stands for Entreat Our Lady. St. Louis de Montfort said, Our Lady is so important for us in our lives because it was through the Blessed Virgin Mary that God came to us. And it is through her that we go to God. That's what today's feast tells us. She shows us the way to go, just as she was assumed body and soul into heaven. So that's the way we're supposed to go. We won't be assumed body and soul immediately into heaven. But when the Lord Jesus comes at the end, there will be the general resurrection and the admission into the kingdom for those who are faithful to him and to his love. Pope St. John Paul II called Our Lady, and so did Pope St. Uh, Paul VI call Our Lady, the star of the new evangelization. Stars are important in our Catholic tradition, aren't they? We think of the star in St. Matthew's Gospel that led the Magi, those wise men in the ways of the world, not to a palace, not to some great government building, but to the humble stable in Bethlehem. They followed the star. She's the star of the new evangelization. There are many hymns written about her in which she's called the star, like the Latin hymn Ave Marie Stella, Hail, O Star of the Sea. You know, if you go to the shore, you find parishes named uh, Stella Maris, Star of the Sea. The mariners, the sailors, reckoned their course in ancient days by the North Star. That's exactly what she is for us. St. Bernard of Clairvaux says, If you do not want to flounder in the tempest, do not avert your eyes from the brightness of this star. When the wind of temptation blows up within you, when you strike upon the rock of tribulation, gaze up at this star, call out to Mary. She never fails. She also always shows us the way to go. St. Paul VI tells us, Mary is the star of the evangelization ever renewed, which the church, always docile to our Lord's command, must accomplish. St. John Paul II said, 
that she is the star that we must follow in these days, and so on and so forth. Pope Benedict XVI said the same thing referring to Our Lady of Aparecida, that great shrine in Brazil to Our Lady when he visited there. Then there's that old Polish hymn, Star Resplendent, Star Serene, referring to Our Lady. She is the one who always leads us on because she brought Christ to us and she will bring us and all peoples to Christ. St. Ambrose tells us that she's the image of the church. She is. We want to know what the church really should look like, filled with faith, filled with grace, filled with hope, ever new. We look to her. She's the mother that has been given to us when Christ was in his hour of greatest need. Entreat her, she never fails. Remember, most gracious Virgin Mary, that never was it known that anyone who fled to thy protection implored thy help or sought thy intercession. So there we have it, the alphabet of evangelization. I could talk about each one of these letters for at least two hours apiece, but we don't have time for that today. This is just kind of wetting our whistle for what lies ahead of us. Dear brothers, as you um, deepen your relationship with Christ and with one another within the church and within Catholic men's fellowship, remember God has a plan for you. In this great time of mercy, this great time in which we're all called to drink deeply of the wellspring of salvation in the sacraments of the church. And at this time, when every one of us who is baptized is called to proclaim the gospel, no one is not needed. We're all needed to do this. Know that I pray for you each and every day, and I ask Our Lady especially to guide and protect you always. Praise be Jesus Christ, now and forever. Amen. Thank you, Bishop. Thank you for the edifying and instructional talk. And now moving on into the question and answer. Uh, first, uh, so I'll say I, but it's from someone else. So I've just moved to Pittsburgh. Um, I finished a long and successful career, and I've developed a lot of skills that I'd like to make use of to support the church. Do you have any suggestions on how I can be useful and helpful to Christ here in the Diocese of Pittsburgh? I sure do, and I have two ways that I would suggest that you look at. First of all, look to your parish. Look to see what is needed in your parish and speak to your pastor or parish administrator and say, I'm available. Is there anything that you need me to do? Do you know, the truth about our priests today is oftentimes they're uh, so uh, involved and sometimes overwhelmed. We know what On Mission for the Church Alive has been like for all of us in the times of great change when parishes are coming together and forming new identities. It's a great time of, it's a time of great change, but also a great time of opportunity in our lives. But it's also a time of stress, especially for priests when they think I have 500 things to do and I have to get them done today. So it's a great difficulty, but you can be of assistance. And what you need to do is simply to make that offer to your priest. And I certainly encourage our priests all the time to be people who will be opened to what the great gifts that the faithful bring. Be patient, be persistent, be prayerful, and offer yourselves. Then I would say also look to other organizations, good Catholic organizations that you can be involved in, huh? like Catholic Men's Fellowship. Don't give up, ever. Pray, and God will show you the way and will help you. But you have to have a strong identity as a Catholic man, faithful to the teachings of the church and to the gospel, and a person of great hope. 
be someone who's not bringing a problem to anyone, but someone who's always bringing an answer or a solution. Be patient and give yourself over to that. Then there's the one other way that I would suggest. You know, to evangelize, as we remember A, B, C, D, and E, part of that too is simply being courageous enough to talk about your Catholic faith to another person. You know, Catholics really typically aren't good at that for a whole bunch of historical reasons because we've kind of been looking in towards our parishes and maybe not out toward our society. Now, not that there haven't been great missionary efforts, there certainly have been. But we as individuals can always do that. Always have holy cards in your pockets. Always offer to pray for other people when they talk to you. Always hand these things out. Or I always have a, a bunch of rosaries in my car. So uh, inexpensive rosaries. So that if somebody needs something to hold on to, because, you know, that's what we're like, whether we're Catholic or not. We need that something to hold on to. When I was a kid, every time I left the house, my mother did not ask me, do you have your hat in the winter? Do you have your lunch money? Do you have your coat? The only thing she ever said to me is, do you have your rosary? That's so important because it takes care of our spiritual needs. It's the gospel in our pocket. So be a promoter of a life of prayer. Be a one who prays seriously for people. Pray for them on the spot. Get over the shyness. Do it. That's evangelization. No program, no video series, nothing else will do that that needs to be done unless each one of us are willing to proclaim our faith in Christ, to reach out to others in prayer, and to know our Catholic faith well enough to present it to others. I hope that helps. Great, thank you. A follow up from that. Uh, what do we do if our administrator or pastor seems to ignore our offers for help? How do we? Here's what I, yeah, here's busy? what I would suggest you do with that. Uh, don't get angry, you know, because if you get mad, you just have to get glad in the end, huh? That's the way life is. But rather, go to the master. That means go before our Lord in the Blessed Sacrament. Pray and ask for help and direction, and don't give up. Don't be a nag. Don't be someone who opposes the pastor, but be someone who prays for him and looks for other ways to work. Because how this really should work, and recently the Congregation for Clergy in Rome, just about two weeks ago, came out with this wonderful document on pastoral conversion of parishes in service of the evangelizing mission of the church, which means what I refer to in to the first question, that we don't look inward. It's not just about maintaining structures. Those structures are important. We don't just do away with them because of the incarnation. Uh, Christ became one of us. He took on our flesh. So our churches are sacred spaces sanctified by the celebration of his sacrifice and his uh, sacraments and by you know, people coming and praying there. They're so important to us. But we draw our nourishment, our hope from those places, from our schools, from our other parts of the parish, and then we take them out. And we serve the poor, the sick, those who are spiritually poor, those who are confused, those who are in bad situations. We take that out, our faith in Christ, and we share it with others. Great, thank you. Uh, question from David. Do you have any initiatives planned? And specific, my add-on to that is, how can we, as a CMF, uh, tie into those initiatives and help you? Right, great, thank you. I always need help. <laughs> you don't know how much I need help. Uh, you know, I have this scheme to take over the world and to take over the world for Jesus and his mother. That's really my plan and my initiative. And I'm always open to the Holy Spirit as to how that can happen. The kinds of things that I'm doing, and as I mentioned before, I'm an army of one. It's me and my secretary, but 
you know, that never stops me because I know that the most important thing I can do is to have contact with people. In our diocese, we have great evangelization efforts that have been underway for a, a long time, huh? especially in the Secretariat for Catholic Education and Evangelization. Uh, we have a uh, great outreach and uh, formation for youth and young adults on college campuses, uh, on the campuses of our high schools and our elementary schools, our faith formation in parishes, which is tremendously important. So there's a lot of those things in place. I would say go to our website and look to see what is there. And you know that is a great avenue that you can plug into diocesan um, uh, you know, efforts. And remember, the diocese isn't separate from you. The diocese is all of us together. So the diocese isn't just diocesan administration. The diocese is every baptized person under the leadership of Bishop Zubik, huh? who has been appointed as the chief shepherd of the flock. Huh? Every bishop is a successor of the apostles and is someone who acts in the name of Christ in a particular way, having received the fullness of the ordained priesthood. But every one of us has a part to play. So that's one thing. As far as I'm concerned, uh, I will tell you, um, I will support Catholic Men's Fellowship in every way that I can. But I'm also going out to parishes, and I've already begun to do that. I've only been doing this job since the 1st of July. And so, you know it must be a good idea if when you take on this new role of evangelization in the midst of coronavirus, huh? When you can't be with people and, you know, so I would say, you know, there's forces at work against this, but we're not going to let that stop us because we know that God will always provide for us. So I'm beginning to go out and talk to parish councils, to talk to parish staffs, to be with our priests who I know so very well, to interact with our deacons who are such great gifts to our church, huh? our ch local church here in Pittsburgh, to be able to get people to see that it's not just becoming part of a program or a group, but rather it's each one of us being prepared by the alphabet of evangelization to go out and proclaim our, um, our faith in Christ and in his church. Great, thank you. Uh, to respect everyone's time, because it's only scheduled for an hour, I'll ask one last question before Santos gives some parting words. But if you're open to it, Bishop, this has been great. Uh, I'm pretty sure we have the Zoom call reserved for another 30 minutes. Are you fine staying on? I am. Journey? Great. Yeah, sure. Uh, and then for those who need to leave at the hour, we'll have our, our, our closing words anyway. So last uh, within our question is, how do we show courage when people put us down? I assume primarily putting down either for trying to be involved or for being Catholic. Mm -hmm. uh, first of all, I say we'll always respond in love. Huh? Charity is always the rule. So we never get into an argumentative position or we don't respond in the same way, but rather I always think of our Lord. huh? in that uh, any time that I have been clobbered, and I've been clobbered a number of times in my life, probably pretty often, by people who are angry about things or people who have little respect for uh, religious faith or for the Catholic Church, I always say to myself, uh, you know, if he suffered the way that he did, rejected by the people he loves, which is all of us, and we remember that every time we sin, we reject him in one way or another. But that didn't stop him from proclaiming the depths of his love for all people. If he did that, I'm called to do that. I'm called to mirror that in my own life and to respond in love and charity. I've always been involved with the Legion of Mary in my life as a priest and before that, and um, I have great respect for the Legion of Mary. They are doing evangelization since 1922 in the church. And uh, one of the primary things that we always say to those who are active legionaries and go door to door, you offer to pray, you offer them peace and love, 
you never engage in a hostile way, ever. It damages people's understanding of God and what the church is all about. So, uh, you know, in a word, I could say offer it up because God will use that to bring about great good in our lives and the lives of others. Great, thank you. Santos, would you like to give a few pleasant words for those who need to leave at the end of the hour before we go to our extended portion? Yeah, yes, uh, if you can just go also uh, uh, put back on the screen, if I could say a few words. Thank you. Thank you, Bishop, for those uh, very encouraging words. Uh, you know, these are times where uh, there's been so much happening and uh, a lot of questions, and a lot of questions about faith and how God plays into our lives. And I think you really did provide some excellent uh, perspective and opportunities. Um, I've seen like we're okay. There we go. And uh, just uh, wanted to mention that uh, for those men who are interested, I, I, it was, I was encouraged to hear that a number of you want to become engaged. And if men are interested in uh, being involved, uh, we, we uh, the Catholic Men's Fellowship, are very much interested in recruiting you, using your skills. There is tremendous opportunity and some of the things that we have in mind and plan for the future. Uh, uh, recognizing that the, that the coronavirus may be with us for a while. So we are reinventing ourselves, trying to be a bit more effective uh, with uh, the outreach efforts to reach other men. So please, uh, if you're interested, uh, do so. Reach out to me. Uh, my, my telephone number is 412-427-2302. Uh, and uh, you could just call me or text me. I would certainly would love to hear from you. Again, 412-427-2302. I uh, just want to thank all of you uh, for this great opportunity. This is the first uh, series. We hope that we'll be able to do this more. Hopefully you uh, found this to be insightful. I did. Uh, and I felt that the, uh, the topics, especially the A, B, C, D, E, uh, the evangelization principle of Bishop was very insightful. Thank you very much on that. I'll remember that. Uh, Bishop, uh, if you could just at this point, uh, provide us uh, a blessing, a uh, prayer, closing prayer, and a blessing to all of us as we are commissioned to spread the good news and to share the good news of Jesus to the world. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Almighty and eternal God, our Heavenly Father, we rejoice because by the precious blood of your Son, we are your sons, and we offer ourselves to you so that we may proclaim the good news of salvation to all the world in fidelity and with love. We also praise and thank you for the gift of your son, who from the cross gave us his own mother to be our mother. We ask that through her powerful intercession, that we may always seek your will and seek to accomplish it in perfect love and fidelity. And so, through the powerful intercession of Mary, the mother of the church, the mother of God, and the mother of us all, may Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And thank you, Santo, so very, very much for your excellent work. Thanks to all in Catholic Men's Fellowship. Uh, I would say, uh, as Pope St. John Paul II said, that day he was elected, October 16th, 1978, be not afraid. Get after it. Do it. You are so incredibly important. And what a great gift it is for me to be here in this great diocese with you all. God bless you. Thank you. And thank you again, uh, Bishop, for joining us. And, and uh, I'm hoping that we can invite you again for a follow-up series. I'm sure you would welcome that. At your and, service. Uh, and and, thank, and give our, our best wishes and our prayers to uh, Bishop Zubik uh, as well. Thank you so much. All right, well, that, that concludes uh, the series. Uh, and if anyone would like to have any other follow-up questions for the, for the bishop, uh, as Matthew has suggested, uh, you can stay on and ask questions. Otherwise, uh, for those who have to move on, feel free to go ahead and uh, disconnect. And thank you very much uh, for agreeing to stay on. Looking back to the questions, um, 
Can you talk about uh, the importance of unity in the church, especially amongst various ministries? It sounds like um, a lot of people end up trying to start something and then they're not really talking together. It doesn't seem like there's a, a focused, unified parish effort in the ministries. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, uh, if you look at the Catholic Church through the centuries, there's always been uh, unity in diversity, huh? Just look at the different rites of the church, and we see that in Pittsburgh, our Eastern Rite Catholics. And we uh, have had the experience here, of course, of various national parishes, ethnic parishes. And so uh, there, it doesn't have to be just one way of doing things. What unites us is our faith in Christ and by our uh, communion with him in and through his body, the church. Um, in terms of a unifying vision, we find that in the gospel. We find that in what they call the kerygma, huh? That Christ, Jesus Christ, is true God, true man, born of the Virgin Mary, uh, and uh, suffered and died for us on the cross, was raised on the dead, on uh, the third day from the dead, promised the Holy Spirit upon the church, and founded the church. And that he left within the church those wonderful means of being in communion with him and in with one and in communion with one another by the sacraments. That's the essential part. Another thing I would say is, uh, if you don't have a copy of the Catechism of the Catholic Church, get one. And you know, at the end of each one of the sections, not the four main sections, but the smaller sections, there are kind of like catechism in brief. So if you don't read every word of every section, you can go to those areas and you can find out what essentially is there, what essentially the church teaches. You know, Bishop Zubik always says, and he quotes uh, an ancient Latin writer, uh, Nemo dabit quod non habit. You can't give what you don't got <laughs> in the vernacular, huh? So know your faith. Talk to others about it. It's always been like one of my dreams is to start um, a group that would take a look at the catechism over a period of time meeting regularly to do that. I would be very interested in doing that. Uh, if any of you would be interested in that, uh, let me know. You know, my email is uh, wwaltershide at dialpit.org. You can find me on the, on the diocesan website. You can find me in any of the diocesan directories. Um, you won't find my picture in the post office, thank God, but I am easily contacted in other ways. So if you're interested in that, let me know. I would really love to get that up and started. Now, we got to pray our way through coronavirus, huh? But like everything else, coronavirus will have a beginning, a middle, and an end. So we're going to move through that. And we're going to be able to be together again safely and do those kinds of things. In the meanwhile, Zoom is always a possibility. Isn't the same. Hard to converse from the heart uh, when people can't talk. But, you know, uh, we'll get through this together and we'll be able to do that. So that's, a, that's an idea anyway. Great. Thank you. Um, another person has brought up that... They, they've seen in some parishes that there'll be a dynamic pastor that ends up helping foster a lot of new programs, a lot of new initiatives. The parish is actually involved in it. It seems like they're growing and doing well. And then they get moved and the new person either doesn't have the energy or doesn't have the same priorities. And then uh, it seems like without that pastor support, because they're, they're the boss of the parish, uh, those initiatives die. And then that leads to people getting burnt out. Do you have anything to say about that or how to handle that as a layperson? Sure. I can tell you this. I have worked with priests my entire priesthood, both in, well, in, in those in preparation for priesthood too, in, in seminary uh, faculty. Um, I worked in the clergy, uh, the Office for Clergy and Consecrated Life in Harrisburg and also here in Pittsburgh. And I can tell you that the assignment of priests and deacons is always very 
uh, very important, but not always easy to do. And priests are people and human like everybody else, and they all have different gifts. Huh? So we have to keep that in mind too. But here's the thing you have to remember. The priest is not so much the boss now, they have the authority to govern, as in governing the parish. Uh, but really, the identity of the priest is the spiritual father. And we need to encourage our priests and to allow them to be spiritual fathers. Because what's under attack most in our world today? Fatherhood and a good uh, you know, male identity. Uh, that's really important for us to do. So if you approach them as the boss, sometimes they respond as the boss. Huh? You know how that is. It's kind of the feedback that you get. See them as the father, work with them, pray for them. Please pray for our priests and deacons. Now, here's another avenue, and that is with uh, our deacons. Uh, who are ordained to the diaconate, and oftentimes they can be very, very wonderful to work with and to help. And now that's not like going around the pastor or the other priests assigned to the parish, but it is collaboration with a number, another member of the clergy in a way that maybe the priests don't always have the time to do. But I'll tell you this, and I say this to priests all the time, and I know I was a pastor of a large parish with a huge school, with nine nursing homes, a county prison, and a community hospital. So I, I get it. I know what that's like. But when you abdicate as a priest your ability to be spiritual father and to be the teacher of the Catholic faith, for the role of simply being an administrative person, it doesn't work. Huh? So priests should delegate to lay people, those who have the gifts to do the administrative things, but at the same time, step up to the plate to be uh, someone who has what we called the threefold munera. Munera means like an office or responsibility in the church. It's a word gift in a sense. And uh, it is being um, uh, the, the person who sanctifies, who teaches and preaches, and the person who governs. That's what priests are supposed to do. But not as administrative CEOs, but as spiritual fathers. Now, I need to tell you, it ain't easy to do in the world today, huh? When everybody's demanding things and when you have everything about, you know, protection of children, which is absolutely necessary, huh? Uh, imagine what they're going through now with the coronavirus, that they're always under the microscope. And if you're not wearing a mask, if you're not doing this, if you're not doing the other thing, people will complain about that. Uh, imagine what priests have been through because of, the sexual abuse scandals, which uh, is a tiny portion of our priests, but the entire body of priests have to bear that, huh? It's a great suffering for priests to bear. So they got a lot going on, but be their loving sons, be their supporters, even when they're not what the priest was before them, huh? It's always not fair to judge who you are by the person who came before you. I replaced a priest once who was the pastor for 35 years. You know how hard that is? Everything you do is judged against him. So what I did is I smiled at everybody because I'm a smiling person, first of all, but because I truly do love God's people. And slowly things begin to move in the direction that people trust you and help you. So be those people who will step up to the plate and will help Father, even when he says, I don't need you. He does need you. Don't give up. Be that person of support. Great, thank you. And uh, another question related to being ignored by the pastor. It seems like this is a more common issue than I had thought. Uh, the person asks, how can you stay humble 
when the pastor ignores you? Because I can imagine that would be a feeling of betrayal. Because as you said, they're the spiritual fathers of your spiritual fathers ignoring you. How do you reconcile that? Well, you know, uh, maybe I could ask you, uh, how do you stay humble when your wife ignores you? <laughs> Which is another question. Or think about other relationships that we've had. Uh, maybe somebody uh, that uh, we care for very much, that we love, a good friend of ours, maybe. And there might be some disagreement in their life, in your life with them. Uh, it's hard, isn't it? It's really a hard situation. And do you know what the first instinct is, is to clobber the other person, you know? Oh, I'll get back at you, or, you know, I'll give you the cold shoulder, or, you know, uh, I'll leave the parish, or I'll do this, or I'll do that. One thing to remember is we never really know what's happening in the other person's life. So that helps us to gain some insight into that. But again, go to the master. Go to Christ in the Blessed Sacrament, lay it before him, and ask for his help. You know, the disciples asked him, Lord, teach us to pray. I often go to our Lord in the Blessed Sacrament and say, Lord, teach me to love as you love. Huh? This is my commandment, he said. Love one another as I have loved you. Not as we would love one another but as he loved us first. Another favorite prayer of mine before the Blessed Sacrament is, Lord Jesus, truly present in the Blessed Sacrament, work on me. <laughs> I need you to work. And he always does. He never disappoints. Again, good St. John Paul II, be not afraid. Christ yesterday, today, and always the same. He never, ever abandons us. Thank you. Uh, another question. In the business world, every key position has key performance indicators. What are the KPIs for pastors? Uh, I see that saying, basically, how do you pick who will be pastor of a parish? Mm -hmm. Well, how it happens in uh, our diocese and in every diocese uh, is that um, uh, the person who assigns the priest is bishop, the ordinary of the diocese, because the bishop uh, has a role in a relationship with his priest, which is spiritual father. Huh? But what he doesn't just, uh, you know, put names on a paper and throw them up in the air and see where they land. At the same time, uh, you know, there's not uh, a plethora of priests out there. So there's a limited number of people with a limited number of, um, uh, you know, uh, positions or with different gifts. Uh, there is a clergy personnel committee, which is made up uh, of uh, other priests who know their brother priests well and who make suggestions to the bishop also. So there is consultation about that. Uh, you know, um, the other part of it is, uh, you know, we might have, uh, uh, you know, we might use language like skill set or unique key performance um, categories for people. Um, would we talk about uh, the you know, the father of a family in the same way? Probably not, because we would see that there has to be presumed a relationship of love. Now, that doesn't mean that, uh, that's not like a cop-out or just saying that, uh, you know, you just have to take what you, you know, whatever happens, that's not true. But rather, uh, those three areas that I talked about before, you might call, in a sense, key performance areas, but by the grace of holy orders, a man is prepared to do that, uh, you know, to one degree or another. Uh, nature, uh, grace builds on nature, so uh, the openness of God's grace in the priest's life is also an indication of, uh, you know, how well he can do in each one of these areas. So, 
The priest is the spiritual father. He's the one who is the sanctifier, the teacher and preacher. He's also the one who uh, has governance for the parish. Uh, he never works in isolation. There's always and must be good collaboration between the clergy and the laity in the work of proclaiming the gospel and for the good of all the people in the parish and all the people in the parish boundary. Do you know that canon law says the priest, the pastor, is not responsible only for the Catholics within the boundary of the parish, but everyone within the boundary of the parish. You know, that's a little extra added on <laughs> to the list of responsibilities in a way. But, you know, this is not done arbitrarily ever or capriciously. It's done after a lot of prayer and with consultation and great thought. Great, thank you. Um, I'm going to focus on evangelization questions that have come in now, since we've talked about pastors for a good bit of the Q&A. And thank you for answering all these questions about relationships with our pastors. Uh, so one person asked, it really seems like people in their 40s and younger uh, are not responding to the old approaches that worked for the older generation. Uh, what are your thoughts on incorporating more modern technologies and newer approaches as it seems like the growing Christian faith are doing? Um, I, th I think it's great to use whatever we can. Uh, I, I certainly would not, never be opposed to that. Uh, but at the same time, uh, I would say that, uh, you know, our Lord says uh, in a parable, uh, that the kingdom of heaven is like the steward who brings out both the old and the new from his treasury. There will be some things that are perennially applicable, like, for example, uh, heart to heart. Uh, you know, I'm all for using all of, uh, you know, the twittering and tweeting and Zoom calls and all of that kind of thing is very important. It can be very useful. Uh, for Facebook and for all of those kinds of things. But they're not the only answer. There has to be that human interaction that is tempered by God's grace. That's what the body of Christ is throughout the world. We've seen it with the sacraments. We have live stream masses. We have televised masses. And that has been a great gift to our people. I always think, you know, today is the 39th anniversary of the founding of EWTN. The tremendous good that that uh, has done, and especially in this time of pandemic, um, you know, think about it. Uh, a cloistered nun with $600 in the garage started it 39 years ago. Uh, you know, it's like they say in the Acts of the Apostles, if this is of God, it will last. If it's not, it won't. Well, draw your own conclusion from that. Think of the tremendous good that Bishop Zupik has done by, uh, you know, live streaming masses, uh, live streaming uh, devotions, the rosary, the divine mercy chaplet, morning prayer, evening prayer, uh, you know, benediction of the blessed sacrament. What have been done by our priests and deacons in our parishes so important, absolutely. But does that mean that we can kind of tune in and tune out and we never have to go back? No, because the hand can't come through the TV to offer absolution or the body of Christ in the Holy Eucharist. So that tells us that there are some things that we must always use. And Pope Francis has spoken of this too in the midst of the, of the COVID-19 pandemic. There is something about gathering together in prayer, prayer in the family. I, I, you know, I didn't mention that during my ABCDE because like I didn't have time to talk about everything I tried to, but that is something that you can't just do in another way. There's something about being united in praying the rosary, being united of you know of, of being together like that if you would come to my house i live in a little ranch house in in um 
on the grounds of the mother house of the sisters of the Holy Spirit. And in my dining room, there is a picture. It's one of those really old pictures. It's St. Bernadette and Our Lady of Lourdes. And uh, it's on metal. It's one of those real old ones that was painted. And the frame is like all banged up, chipped. You know, it looks like it was through uh, World War I, II, and three to come. Uh, and a couple of years ago, I thought, you know, I'm going to, you know, maybe get it reframed. And then I thought of it. This belonged to my grandparents. And when I was growing up, every evening after supper, we knelt before it and prayed the rosary. Formative for me in my life. And I thought, you know, all those chips and nicks and banged up things is a reminder of the spiritual battles that were fought in front of that picture as my mom and dad encouraged us to pray for so many people and really where my vocation to the priesthood in many ways was born. So, you know, we gotta be smart. We gotta use everything at our disposal, but we should never throw the baby out with the bath. Great, thank you. I, I can definitely echo that. The pandemic has helped me appreciate how physical our faith is. And uh, it's been interesting talking to some friends where they're like, oh, you can just watch it online. I'm like, that's not, that's not how sacraments work. Uh, another question was, so say that we want to start an evangelization effort as you brought up, the person to person is very important to that. And we've seen CDC guidance on what to do, what not to do. Do you have any suggestions on resources or just straight suggestions on how as Catholics with evangelization to apply those guidelines? Because like, just say, oh, maintain six feet. Like, What's a good way to do that that doesn't just seem like you're standing standoffishly? Well, do you know, uh, I'll show you one way that I do it. And I want to show you uh, the mask that I have, that I wear all the time. It's the divine mercy. So when you're talking to me when I'm wearing this mask, you know who is uppermost on my mind. So that's a very practical way of doing it. You can find uh, Catholic themed masses, uh, masks, I'm sorry, on, uh, you know, amazon.com, you know, nothing stops amazon.com, but nothing stops God either. Uh, I have a Lady of Guadalupe one coming too. Uh, you know, you might say, uh, Bishop, you're a little crazy. Well, you know, if you told me that, I'd say I already know that. But uh, like St. Paul, I'd like to be a fool for Christ. I want to proclaim him in every way that I can. So that's one way you can do it. Or preface the conversation by saying, you know, uh, because of the times in which we live and because of our care for one another, I need to stay six feet away from you. Uh, and you'll get all kinds of responses. You'll get, you know, people saying, uh, it's all crazy, we don't need to do it. Or we'll have people who will, you know, kind of be on the other end of the spectrum and are really scrupulous about it. I always say, like all things, virtue is in the mean. We do what we need to do as an act of charity to protect other people, but we don't allow it to stop us from doing what we need to do. We follow the guidelines. There's no doubt about it. We've been following the guidelines from the uh, to Mystic Institute uh, from the uh, Dominicans in Washington that was formulated by people with great expertise in medical care, in liturgy, and in social science. And so we do that at Mass so that we can do what we need to do and the sacraments, the grace of the sacraments can be given to us all at the same time protecting people. So I would say follow the rules, but do it and know that this is going to, we're gonna get through this and we're going to be bringing Christ to others, not then, but now and through this crisis. Great, thank you. I hadn't heard of the Thomistic Institute guidance. Was that the name? Would that be able to be looked up? By That's our on our diocesan web uh, website. And yeah, if you if you if you um, uh, if you Google that, you can find it. It's from the Dominican House of Studies in Washington D.C. They're they're the guidelines that formed our uh, response to the celebration of Mass in the sacraments in our own diocese. Okay. 
Thank you. Um, there's been some comments about how uh, some of the parishes uh, seem to really be struggling uh, to, I guess, do enough cleaning to have some events. Like my my parish, they even said in there, like, we can't afford the sanitizer to sanitize all the pews. Mm -hmm. Do you have any recommendations on how we can help? Because I could also imagine it might be not enough people showing up to clean. Mm -hmm. Do you think that's appropriate for us to offer to help with that process? Uh, here, you know, I would say yes, but here's uh, the, another part of that you have to keep in mind. Um, uh, one of the concerns is in our parishes, uh, a lot of the people who volunteer tend to be like my age, you know, I'm an old guy, and that's the age that's in risk, you know, at risk. So if younger people can do it, that's always a good thing to do, but you also have to be trained to do it. So you can always ask about that. And, and, and volunteer to do that. I think that that would be a, a great thing to do, a great service of charity, uh, you know, to enable people to be able to come to the ma to Mass and to the sacraments in a safe way, to come before our Lord in the Holy Eucharist. Great, thank you. I think I only scheduled the meeting for one more minute, so I might get cut off with this. So I would like to say just thank you very much, Bishop, for coming to your flock and helping us um, learn how to better evangelize and better understand the issues, especially those affecting the Diocese of Pittsburgh. If anybody has any questions, email me. That's the, the best way to get to me. You can also call my office, but uh, email and I guarantee you'll get a response. You're all in my prayers. Thank you so very much. Thank, thank you, Bishop. And thank you everyone who came. Have a wonderful assumption. Take care. Thank you. Thank you, Matt.